and members. We'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 12573 in the name of Michael Matheson on historical sexual offences, pardons and disregards Scotland Bill at stage three. Now, before the debate begins, I'm required under standing orders to decide whether any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the bill does such. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. Now, could I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary, to speak and to move the motion. Officer, I'd like to begin this debate by thanking the members and clerks of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for their careful consideration of the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill. I'd also like to thank the external stakeholders who took the time to engage both in the development of the legislation and in the Parliament's scrutiny of the Bill. Their input has been valuable in helping to understand the benefits this bill will bring and where improvements could usefully have been considered. In particular, I want to offer my thanks to Tim Hopkins of the Equality Network, who has been an enormous help in sharing his knowledge with the Scottish Government and with the Parliament. Members will Members will know Tim has spent many, many years campaigning to bring about the equality and improve the human rights situation of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people in Scotland. And he should take credit for his excellent work in helping to shape the final contents of this bill. General Officer, I think it's entirely right to thank those individuals who also gave evidence to the committee of their own experience of the discrimination that came about simply because they were gay. Think about that for a moment. Discrimination simply because of someone's sexuality. It seems a, a lifetime ago, but actually the specific laws that perpetrated such discrimination were only removed from the statute relatively recently. For example, the age of consent was only equalized in 2001. In the scrutiny of this bill, much has been made of the progress that has been made in Scotland in recent years in terms of improving equality. Yet, of course, presiding officer, much remains to be done. And this parliament should continue to improve and explore where discrimination exists and what actions can be taken to help reduce and eliminate such discrimination. This bill is a continued part of that process. Members will be aware that the bill makes provision in two distinct but connected areas. Firstly, it provides a pardon to people who were convicted of historical offences that criminalised sexual activity between men for activity which is now legal. And secondly, it puts in place a scheme to enable a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence to apply to have that conviction disregarded so that it will never be disclosed as, for example, as part of an enhanced disclosure check. The distinction between the two, of course, is important. The pardon is automatic and it is symbolic. If a person has received a conviction for what is a historical sexual offence, then they receive the pardon. There has been some comment about whether a pardon is the correct approach. To pardon something can be seen as to excuse it, but still suggest it was something that was wrong. And I and we understand those concerns. That's why the First Minister stood in this Parliament in November last year and spoke to everyone in this chamber informally apologising. I think, President Officer, it's worth remembering and reminding ourselves of some of the uh, comments that were made by the First Minister on that occasion, when she said, for people who 
We are convicted of same-sex sexual activity that is now legal. The wrong has been committed by the state, not by the individuals. The wrong has been done to them. Those individuals, therefore, deserve an unqualified apology as well as a pardon. That apology, of course, can only come from government and from parliament. It cannot come from the justice system. After all, the courts, prosecutors and the police were enforcing the law of the land at the time. The simple fact is that over many decades, parliamentarians in Scotland supported, or at the very least, laws that we now recognise were completely unjust. Those laws criminalised the act of loving another adult. They deterred people from being honest about their identities to family, friends, neighbours and colleagues. By sending a message from Parliament, homosexuality was wrong, they encouraged rather than deterred homophobia and hate. Nothing that Parliament does can erase those injustices. But I hope this apology, alongside our new legislation, will provide some comfort to the people who have endured them. Presiding officer, let me briefly explain about the disregard. The disregard scheme is a practical measure to address the fact that those who were convicted for engaging in same-sex sexual activity can continue to suffer discrimination as a result of those convictions. While it's likely that any such convictions are now spent under the terms of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act and therefore would not routinely be disclosed, then when, say, going for a job that does not involve working with vulnerable groups, we accept there is a risk that such convictions could continue to be disclosed when a person is applying for a role, for example, working with children or vulnerable adults when, required, when requiring an enhanced disclosure check, which includes information about spent convictions. An application is required for a disregard. However, let me assure members that the Scottish Government, who will administer the scheme, intend to keep the process and the bureaucracy to an absolute minimum. The briefest of details are all that will be required to allow an application to be made. A person's name and contact details, any information about the conviction, such as the location. Sign officer, I know that where concerns, there were concerns expressed during the scrutiny process about the complexity that might be involved in applying. That is not the intention of the Scottish Government and I can confirm the Scottish Government will work closely with the Equality Network and other stakeholders to make the process of applying for a disregard as straightforward as possible. From the information received with an application, the Scottish Government will explore with relevant record keepers such as Police Scotland whether information is held about the conviction to inform a decision whether to grant a disregard. So, officer, as the committee have highlighted in their consideration of the bill, it's important that we emphasise that the pardon is symbolic and that a person who wants to ensure that any conviction they have for same-sex sexual activity that is now lawful are removed from their criminal history system must apply for a disregard. I can assure the Chamber, President Officer, and members of the committee that guidance material will be issued by the Scottish Government to make this very point clear. During stage two of the bill, there was considerable debate about ensuring people understood why a pardon was being offered and why the pardon had to be seen within the wider context of this legislation and the apology which was given by the First Minister. That is why when a disregard is granted, I can confirm that the Scottish Government will make clear to recipients what the First Minister said when apologising, so that there is no misunderstanding as to the nature of why a disregard has been granted and a pardon triggered. Then, officer, 
In beginning my conclusion, I think it is worth highlighting the excellent cross-party support this bill has received. All members of the Equality and Human Rights Committee have been very effective in their scrutiny of this bill, always seeking to improve in a collaborative and helpful spirit. It's how legislation should be done whenever possible. No one, of course, needs reminding of the damage done to people's lives by these discriminatory and unjust laws, and that such damage cannot be undone. Unfortunately, for many decades, parliamentarians in Scotland supported or at least tolerated laws which criminalised the individuals because of their sexuality. A variety of people were, of course, harmed. Those men who were convicted of offences completely unjustly, less affected and, in some cases, probably destroyed. Men who, while uh, were not convicted, were living at a time when the risk was there that they would be criminalised but also the families and friends of these men, witnessing loved ones not able to be them true selves. The ramifications of these unjust laws spread far and wide. These laws deterred people from being honest about their identity to their family, their friends, their neighbours and their colleagues. These laws spent, sent a horrific message that homosexuality was wrong and so they encouraged rather than deterred homophobia and hate. A week after the independent review on hate crime reported its findings recommending further action to help tackle hate crime, it's pleasing that it is laws designed to protect individuals' identity that is the focus of attention rather than the type of overt discrimination captured within our old criminal law. It is also, however, a sign that while we should all welcome Scotland's modern, open, inclusive approach on equality issues, there is still discrimination lurking. And that is sadly why hate crime law continues to be necessary at all. Sign officer, this bill makes absolutely clear through the pardon that this parliament acknowledges that those who were convicted of offences for engaging in same-sex sexual activity have done nothing wrong. By establishing a disregard process, it will also ensure that people can take steps to ensure that they do not continue to suffer discrimination as a result of such unjust convictions. And seen within the context of the apology offered by the First Minister and all of the political parties in this chamber, this is a proud day for this Parliament and a proud day for Scotland. Then, officer, I move that Parliament agrees the historical sexual offences, pardons and disregards bill be passed. Thank you. I now call on Annie Wells to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased again to have the opportunity to be part of the debate on the Historical Sexual Offences Pardons Disregard Scotland Bill, a bill that's had unanimous support in the Scottish Parliament since day one. Without repeating much of what I said at stage one, this really is a landmark bill and one with a poignant message. Modern attitudes have changed. And by supporting this bill today, we are setting in stone that the policies of the past were wrong and that Scotland is on its way to becoming a more just, fair and equal society. We cannot right the massive injustice that took place, but we can hopefully lift some of the burden of conviction and give gay men convicted of crimes no longer illegal the opportunity to really move on with their lives. I would also like to put on record my thanks to Tim Hopkins of the Equality Network the witnesses and speakers who came before the committee, my fellow committee members and all the clerks and those associated with the Equality and Human Rights Committee for their tireless work on this bill. 
As many have touched upon throughout the Bill's proceedings, it's very difficult to believe that these discriminatory laws are in the living memory of most of us in, here in the Chamber today. Up until 1980, same-sex sexual activity between men was an offence, regardless of where it took place. And it wasn't until the new millennia that the age of consent was brought in line with opposite-sex couples. I am extremely pleased that the Bill has built on legislation south of the border, both by applying the pardon to both the living and those who have passed away, and taking into account the sexual offences that were generic under common law, such as shameless indecency and breach of the peace, but discriminate against men who engaged in same-sex same -sex sexual activity. It wasn't until the evidence sessions and hearing the personal testaments of two anonymous witnesses that I realised just how important this was. A witness who was just 20 was charged with intent to commit a homosexual act in a public place after having kissed a man in the street in the early 90s. Importantly, as I stated in stage one, the purpose of the bill is not to delete the laws from our history books. The purpose of it is to draw a line under these laws by offering a pardon to gay men convicted of sexual offences that are no longer illegal and to make provisions for a system whereby those with convictions can apply to have them disregarded. During evidence sessions, it was quite clear that what victims wildly saw more than anything was the symbolic acknowledgement that the laws themselves were discriminatory and we must remain aware of what took place. The bill also makes provisions for a system whereby gay men convicted of these crimes can apply to have them disregarded. And again, during evidence sessions, the personal testimonies of the two witnesses highlighted the lingering impact discriminatory laws could have on someone's life, despite the laws having been repealed. Witness A spoke of the embarrassment he feared in applying for jobs, something that ultimately held back his career. And Witness B spoke of the embarrassment that had caused him as part of his work in the voluntary groups. As a member of the committee, I was also able to engage with the bill at stage two, and I wish to use the second part of my speech to address some of the more nuanced points raised. At stage one, I had highlighted the need to advertise the existence of the disregard process, making it abundantly clear that despite the automatic pardon, there would be a separate process in which to apply for a disregard. The apology issued by the First Minister rightly received national media attention, but we cannot assume that following from this, the information around the disregard process will naturally disseminate into the wider public. Again, this was evidenced during the committee stage when one witness flagged that having asked his friends their thoughts about the bill prior to attending the session, they knew nothing about it. And although I withdrew an amendment requiring Scottish ministers to promote public awareness and understanding of the operation of this Act, I was reassured by the Justice Secretary that the Scottish Government would work closely with relatives and stakeholders, including Stonewall and Equality Network, to ensure that those with convictions are made aware of the pardon and disregard scheme. For those living in remote rural areas where word of mouth is far less likely, and those not linked with LGBTI groups, this is particularly important. And as pointed out by the Law Society of Scotland, applicants must be made aware of their rights to apply through various social media platforms, and they must be actively encouraged to apply, particularly in the context of the highly competitive job market. Akin to this, we must also see a disregard system that is simple, transparent and capable of being easily understood. As Tim Hopkins from the Equality Network pointed out during the committee stage, because of a complicated application system, it was estimated that only 2% of those people el eligible in England and Wales had applied for the disregard. Of note, it was also highlighted during stage two by Mary Fee, it was perhaps as equally important to provide family members and partners of people who now deceased something individual and personalised in order to provide comfort. I commend Mary Fee for her efforts in that regard, and I was pleased to see the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to providing a letter of comfort signed by the First Minister to relatives of those affected. I also welcome reassurances from the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Government will provide guidance to the body responsible for the disregard system S scheme, including Disclosure Scotland. If you look at the bill in the context of the journey towards LGBTI equality, we still have a long way to go. A recent report by LGBT Youth Scotland 
showed that young people still experience discrimination that negatively affects their health and wellbeing. 71% of LGBTI young people and 82% of transgender young people, for example, have experienced bullying in schools on the grounds of being LGBT. 35% of LGBT young people and 41% of transgender young people said they'd experienced hate crime or hate incident in the past year. Across the world, gay relationships still remain illegal in 72 countries. Another reason why it's so important to send out the message that Scotland truly is a leader in LGBTI equality. To conclude today, I would again like to voice my support for this bill and its final stage. By achieving support for this bill today, we are sending out a message in Scotland to the LGBT community that equality really matters. We cannot undo the wrongs of the past, but we can symbolically mark the injustices that took place and lift the burden of conviction. In doing so, we can continue the journey to true LGBTI equality. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Daniel Johnson to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Stage three debates can be slightly odd and, dare I say, disjointed. For those involved in tabling and debating amendments, they can be hugely important and engaging. For everyone else in the chamber, it can be slightly bamboozling, watching our colleagues debating vigorously, but not always sharing their enthusiasm. This bill is different, and not just because there are no stage three amendments, but I think it's an, a, an important sign of this bill's strength and balanced approach. And I would commend the government and all those uh, involved in drafting it uh, for that. Nor is it the degree to which the proposals brought forward in this bill have such broad and unanimous support from all parties in this chamber, though that in itself is surely a mark of the progress we have made in on equality in Scotland. But the biggest difference for me is the opportunity this bill has given us to reflect in this parliament, to reflect on the progress we have made, to reflect on the need to resist complacency when it comes to equality and on historic injustices, but and also to reflect on the purposes and effect that legislation in this place has outside and continues to have in years to come. Scotland only decriminalised same-sex acts in 1980, and the last anti-gay references in Scots law were only removed five years ago. Indeed, in the stage one debate, I was particularly struck by Christina McKelvey's remarks, where she outlined that where Scotland sits in a historical context with other countries. France repealed its laws against homosexuality in 1791. Italy in the 19th century, Scandinavian countries just after the Second World War. So in passing this bill today, we have to acknowledge how slow in some ways we have been to make progress. But we should also use that to commit to ensuring that in the future, Scotland leads the world on equality for all and righting historical injustices. Thank you. And on that, can I thank the committee and indeed echo the comments made of thanks to all the stakeholders which have participated in giving evidence and scrutinising this bill, because it's what has enabled, I think, the very fruitful debate that we have had so far and will have this afternoon. The Equality and Human Rights Committee produced an excellent Stage 1 report, which has brought to life the many issues that surround these historical injustices. The, the, the issues around the simple the fact that simple basic human acts and behaviours were criminalised, that careers have been hindered and they have been hindered to this day, and that people have been prevented from volunteering in their communities. For too many, these unjust laws, while the laws themselves may have been repealed and abolished, their effect is far from historic. They have impact on lives today. So this bill not only is an important step towards putting uh, many of these issues right. It does so in a sensible and pragmatic way. It is welcome that this bill will address those convicted for importuning and, uh, and, and also through a discriminatory uh, local bylaws. This learns an important lesson from England and Wales where the scope of the equivalent law is felt to be too narrow and there is a disappointment in the level of uptake. It is also welcome as the approach of creating an automatic pardon alongside a mechanism of disregards. This is sensible because it will ensure that the law and its actions are both universal but also effective. It is only right that a pardon is by default rather than requiring people to apply for it. 
But equally important is that the effect of these historically unjust convictions does not persist, which requires a robust and effective disregard system. But what is perhaps most vital, and I would echo the comments made by both the Cabinet Secretary and others, is that it's vital that we are clear and unequivocal on the meaning of that pardon. It is only in that strict legal sense. Because let us be very clear, men who were unjustly criminalised under these laws did nothing wrong and are guilty of nothing. The pardon is simply an acknowledgement of that injustice. The only guilt and the only apology is on behalf of the state which criminalised so many homosexual men and was the source and instigator of those historic injustices. So I welcome, also welcome the improvements that have been made to this bill at stage two. It is critically important that we have a system of disregards that is simple and straightforward to use. It is therefore welcome that the government have responded to calls for the affirmative procedure to apply to the regulations which are brought forward for the enactment of this bill. This will enable Parliament and the public to test and scrutinise how this system will work and make sure this legislation is as effective and as impactful as possible. I'd also like to acknowledge Stuart Stevenson's amendments, which will make sure that failure to accurately recall one's exact details will not prevent applications for disregards. Many people may well find it difficult to remember their exact address or may have actually changed their name since they received the conviction. His amendment will mean that they are not disadvantaged, and I think we should thank him for that amendment. But I would also like to highlight my colleague Mary Fee's amendment, which she withdrew at stage two, which sought to make provision for families to apply for posthumous uh, pardons. Now, I understand the issues that this may have caused from a technical perspective, but I do welcome the government's commitment to implement such a scheme without legislation. However, I would urge the minister to outline what progress uh, will be made on this in his summing up speech and to provide clarity on when this scheme is expected to be in place. It is also vital that there is awareness of this legislation and how uh, 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 people can make use of it. The downside of the approach of providing an automatic pardon in conjunction with a system of disregard by application is the possibility of confusion, as in, indeed the Cabinet Secretary noted. We do not want a situation where people think that by dint of the pardon, convictions will no longer appear on record checks. An effective programme of public awareness is vital so that there is understanding of the difference between the pardon and disregard afforded by this bill and also how to apply for the disregards. So therefore, I would also welcome any further detail the government can provide on plans for public information and awareness raising. To conclude, providing officer, this is a very welcome and much needed bill uh, which has uh, caused us all to reflect. The bill will have Scottish Labour's full support this evening as we seek to right the wrongs of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Patrick Harvey to open for the Greens. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to echo the thanks that have been offered by others to everyone who's contributed uh, to the scrutiny of this bill, to the evidence presented for it, uh, and to the improvement of it during the, the process of its passage through Parliament. Uh, there is a lot to celebrate uh, in the passing of this bill, an attempt to right an historic wrong. Uh, this bill will not erase history uh, or the hurt and the harm done by the state, but it will give, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, some comfort to those living uh, with the consequences of those uh, hurts and harms that were done by the state. Can I also echo the Cabinet Secretary's thanks and admiration for Tim Hopkins, who I think has been uh, a hugely important part of pretty much every step toward LGBTI equality that Scotland has made uh, in, in all of the time that I can remember, certainly. So there is, yes, a lot to celebrate. And perhaps it would be better if we all simply joined together in that celebration and left the matter at that. I'm afraid that I have to make some remarks uh, which are of a less upbeat nature. At stage one, I said that as we take this step, we should make the statement that underpins it mean something. We should all go back to our political parties and insist that prejudice and discrimination against LGBTI people should be no more acceptable in our politics or in our candidate selection than racism, anti-Semitism, sectarianism, or any other form of bigotry. We're a long way from that point, presiding officer. At the 
end of that stage one debate, every member of this parliament nodded along with the happy consensus and the general principles of this bill were agreed without a division. A few days after that debate, I was disturbed to see an email from a constituent that I won't name, which contained a reply about this bill from John Mason, MSP. Yes, I'm not really sure that I agree with retrospective pardons and apologies, he wrote. He went on, I do not see that we can go around pardoning and apologizing for everything that other people did that does not conform to modern customs. Will the Italians be apologizing for the Roman occupation? Where, where to begin with this? Is it the, the flippant tone? Is it the complete absence of any attempt even to show understanding of the arguments in favor of this bill? Or the, the reference to ancient history? Presiding officer, this is not ancient history. This is living history. I will do in a moment once I've torn another strip off the member. Many of the people whose lives were subject to untold harm by their own government are living still and they do not deserve to be dismissed in this way. More than any of these factors, I think it's the cowardice in sitting here quietly assenting to something he didn't believe in and then sending this email to someone he knew would share his views. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that John Mason is the only MSP who holds such views, and I can only single him out on this issue because I happened to be sent this email. But if he or anyone else does hold this view, let them have the nerve to vote against this bill at decision time tonight so that their constituents can see where they really stand. And let every political party have the nerve to say that there are consequences for saying one thing and doing another. I give way. John Mason. I thank, the member John for giving, Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I wonder if he would accept that tolerance is an important virtue, and would he accept that people of many traditional faiths and for other reasons eh, believe that it is wrong eh, for one person of the eh, same sex to have a sexual relationship with someone else, eh, and that is a genuinely held belief eh, by a range of people. And some people would believe that it is only within marriage that people should have sexual relationships. Mr. Harvey. I do acknowledge that homophobia exists within a religious context, just as a commitment to equality also exists within a religious context. The question is one of consistency, presiding officer. Political parties whose leaders oppose racism would be condemned, and rightly so, for continuing to select racist candidates for election at any level. Political parties whose leaders oppose sectarianism would be condemned, and rightly so, for continuing to select candidates for election at any level who were sectarian. In the same way, political parties whose leaders oppose prejudice and discrimination on grounds of sexuality or gender identity should be condemned for continuing to select homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic candidates for election at any level. I don't expect immediate perfection. Neither racism nor sectarianism has been wholly driven from our politics. But I do say that our communities have the right to see political parties take the issue seriously and at least begin to address it. Yet has any MSP ever faced consequences for opposing LGBTI equality and human rights in this chamber? Not just historic matters like those in today's bill or how people voted decades ago on other issues, but very recent matters like the right to marry. Would any MSP face consequences for opposing trans rights when that matter comes to the vote? Presiding officer, passing this bill is important. It aims to set right an historic wrong. Indefensible actions by the state against its own citizens in defiance of their dignity and their basic human rights. But passing this bill without also changing our culture and our practice in the here and now would not be enough. It's time, I believe, for a little less patience, both with those who oppose equality in their actions and with those who nod along with the consensus when their actions are on the record, but then happily tell the bigots exactly what they want to hear when they think there's nobody watching. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harvey. I now call Alec Cole-Hamilton on behalf of Liberal Democrats. Mr. Cole-Hamilton, please.
Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the government for the tone they've set in today's debate and indeed for the journey they've carried myself and my fellow members of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee uh, through the passage of this bill. Some days at work are truly righteous days, heart-singing days, days of hungry and unanimous commitment to a singular end, and this is one such day. Today in the pages of this bill, I think we have not just the opportunity to unpick the injustice of the past that has represented a stain on our national conscience, but also to offer a profound and unreserved apology to those men, both alive and dead, who have done, been done incalculable harm by the policies and laws of the past. Today, we, it is right that we look back on darker days, and I am glad that they seem uh, far, far behind us, although there are many frontiers against which we still have to push back on. We were recently offered a, a glimpse into life in less enlightened times. I'm sure many members uh, will have watched recently the TV adaptation of a very English scandal, which had the activities of my former party leader, Jeremy Thorpe, very much at the centre point. Uh, that was something of uncomfortable viewing for me, not uh, for the reasons members might think. Obviously, there was a certain amount of shame attached to having a party leader undergoing trial for attempted murder, and that shame followed us for many years until it was eclipsed by decision to enter coalition government. Um, but the, it was the atmosphere of rank homophobia and intolerance that characterise that political environment and establishment that really troubled me, that, that made me realise just what we are doing in the passage of this bill today. One scene depicted uh, Boofy Gore, who was Earl of Arran, trying to canvass for support for his bill in 1967 to decriminalise uh, homosexuality, homosexual activity, which came off the back of the recommendations of the Wolfenden Report some 10 years previously, such as the glacial movement at the time towards gay rights. Um, he received, in, that, in the course of that scene, in the course of his efforts in that act, uh, such derision, such widespread persecution and homophobia at the highest levels of Her Majesty's government. He was doing that to memorialize his late brother who had killed himself as a result of the shame that he had felt attached to him as a result of his sexuality. And his late brother was not alone. So many men, so many men, uncalculable totals of men, took their own life uh, as a result of the persecution and the shame of an intolerant society which was uh, on the statute book, enshrined in the statute book, in the laws that we have happily struck down in Maine and which, for which we are atoning for today. And I'm very glad, and I'll come on to this in more detail in a minute, but that is why I think it was very important that Mary Fee uh, asked for the government to recognise the needs of those men who have left this world and the families they leave behind for that posthumous recognition. That 1967 Act uh, represented the first stage in our journey, uh, but the, the darkness did not leave these islands as a result of it. And success, thankfully, successive generations have pushed back on that frontier ever backwards, with, with the decriminalization in Scotland, as we heard in 1980, equalization of age of consent, and indeed equal marriage. And I am very grateful to be part of that story today. Now, there, I think it's rare that the, there are rare are the occasions when government are so helpful and so inclusive in the passage of a bill, but this is by necessity one of them. And it was right, and I, I felt, and I said at the time, I would not bring forward amendments at stage two, and nor did I, because the government had carried us on such an inclusive journey to make this bill uh, as good as it possibly could be. We talked about whether we should expunge the record entirely, but we heard quite powerfully from campaigners that to delete the record of these uh, criminal offences would be a kind of revisionist history for the future so that we could not look on the stain of the past. But it was impossible to make these uh, disregards automatic because of the very obscure nature of the crimes for which men uh, were sentenced. We talked about compensation. Now, I was very gratified and humbled to see that not one person who came before the committee from the stakeholder groups or the individuals affected uh, had ever thought about compensation. It was not what they wanted, and they felt it would create uh, a, an artificial hierarchy of victimhood. And finally, that posthumous recognition. I'm so delighted to hear there will be a scheme included for as a result. 
At every stage, this bill has been delightful. I just want to put on my record my thanks for Tim Hopkins, for Stonewall, for the two men who gave us anonymous testimony with such grace and levity and humour, considering the obvious and measurable harm that their convictions had done to their lives and their careers. Deputy Presiding Officer, I will look back on this day. It's one of those days in Parliament you know you will look back on. I'll even maybe tell my grandkids about it. I got to serve in a Parliament which on a glorious afternoon in early summer with a rainbow flag hanging at a mast outside struck down one of the last remnants of a more prejudiced era and sought atonement for the harm that Hitler had done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now move to the open debate. There is some time in hand for interventions for members. I call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Liam Kerr. Ms McKelvey, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I think this is quite an emotional day, and I'm not going to say much more about that because I might get too emotional and not get through the rest of what I need to say. So, cause, because having the chance uh, through the law to right an historic wrong is not a regular occurrence for politicians. Uh, it's not an experience that we have every day. But today, that's exactly what we do. We stand up in this chamber, we face the nation, and we say to those men affected, we were wrong, you were not a perpetrator, you were not a criminal, you were a victim of a system that treated you with discrimination and prejudice. Presiding officer, a man who loved or was attracted to another man was at great risk, grave risk in our country up until only a few years ago. For it was only in February 1981 that the law in Scotland changed to partially decriminalise same-sex relations between men. And then only for men aged 21 and over. And while the age of consent between heterosexuals in Scotland had been 16 years old since 1885, it wasn't until 2001 that the age of consent between men in Scotland was set at 16. Remarkably, it was only in December 2013 that the last very last anti-gay terminology was removed from the law in Scotland, 2013, a few short years ago. So here we are at the final stage of the historic, Historical Sexual Offences Pardons Disregard Scotland Bill. And we're very proud to be here today. This bill began its journey through the Equality and Human Rights Committee on the 1st of February this year. Appropriately, this coincided with the start of LGBT History Month. So we were looking back at history whilst hopefully making some of that history too. And can I at this point thank the clerks, the Spice and everyone who gave us evidence we needed to deliberate on this bill and to bring it to this historic point today. Can I pay tribute and personal thanks to my MSP colleagues for their diligence, which was great, their care, which was deep, and their dedication to ensuring that this important bill made its way through the processes of this parliament. But I want to pay particular tribute to the two men who told us their story and the impact their convictions had on their lives. The stories were profound. Alex Cole Hamilton is right. They spoke to us that day with great levity and great humility, but with real understanding of that lived experience of the impact that it had. One man told us that he dreaded having to undertake his Scottish Social Services Council registration in case and he said, in case I was going to have to be interviewed and was going to be told I might not be fit to do my job because of my conviction. You just don't know, but these things are the things that are in the back of your mind constantly. Imagine living with that your whole professional career. Another witness told us that he was fined 40 shillings for loitering nearly 40 years ago, and it still shows up on his advanced disclosure check today. He said someone fined under the same bylaw for failing to clear snow from their path outside the door would have been fined 40 shillings. But my guess is that the conviction wouldn't show up 40 years later on, on an enhanced disclosure check for them. And from my point of view, and this is this man speaking again, this has been dredging up an incident from the past, which is an embarrassment to me, as is many of the people I deal with in my charitable work because most of them are older and quite vulnerable. It just seems totally irrelevant to my experience. I agree, he was absolutely right. These stories, presiding officer, are not unusual, but they have had a profound impact and influence on the lives of the men affected. We've heard many of the stories today. This bill matters, not just to those who faced the injustices of a system that treated them with contempt. 
It matters because we must never take for granted the progress that we have made in tackling discrimination. It can roll back just as quickly as we push it forward, and we should never forget that. But this bill matters because it will help to improve the lives of men with unfair historical convictions by allowing them to have those convictions removed from their records. The disregard process will remove the discrimination they face when applying for certain jobs or serving as volunteers in their local communities. And let's not forget, presiding officer, men were imprisoned, fined, publicly shamed, bullied, lost jobs, lost opportunities, lost friends and family because the law at the time was prejudiced and many of them lost their lives. Men like Alan Turing, an English mathematician, a cryptanalyst crypt and a computer scientist who was influential in the development of computer science. He took his own life following a course of female hormones commonly known as chemical castration by doctors. He was given this as an alternative to prison after he was prosecuted by the police because of his homosexuality. So he was given an enforced medical procedure instead of going to prison. What a Hobson's choice that is for anyone. And when launching this bill, the First Minister gave an apology to those men criminalised, marginalised and discriminated against by our law. And we all herald that apology. That was the right and proper thing to do. And what we do today is the right and proper thing when coming together in this parliament to bring to force that apology, to make it real with, that, with the law today, to take away the discrimination and right that wrong. Alan Turing, when talking about imagination said, and I quote, sometimes it is the people no one can imagine anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. He was talking about machines, but I would quite like to think he was talking about our parliament today. And I wonder what he and many who went before him would say today. Would they see a parliament maturing, growing and thriving on knowledge and understanding? The knowledge to know what needs to be done and the understanding to know how to do it. The humility to say we were wrong and with the good grace to say we will fix it today. This bill has been a long time coming. The Equality Networks with Tim Hopkins, who we've all paid tribute today, to today, Stonewall and many, many others have given us the understanding through their drive, their determination and their campaigning. This is what we needed as parliamentarians to bring this bill to its final stage. This is a proud day for us all, a day when we say no more will we discriminate against you because of your sexuality. No more will the system work against you. No more will you be de denied opportunity in your life and work by prejudicial law. Today, we right this wrong, and today, presiding officer, we vote with pride. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like my party colleagues, and I hope and expect colleagues throughout the Parliament, I'll be very pleased to agree that the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill be passed at decision time tonight. I made the point at stage one that it is my view that the state should have as small a role as sensibly possible in adjudicating on or prescribing consenting adults' business. The state has, for too long, taken far too great a role in exactly that proscription. It is extraordinary to think that until 1887 in Scotland, the crime of sodomy attracted the death penalty and from then life imprisonment. And that in 1885, Parliament enacted the La Boucher Amendment, which prohibited gross indecency. Interestingly, we don't even know what gross indecency meant because Victorian morality couldn't bring itself to state clearly what it was that it wished to prohibit. And I'll come back to that later on. Thankfully, attitudes have advanced and slowly the law has followed. Acts once considered illegal and immoral are now acknowledged to be consensual, adult, appropriate, legal. And therefore, it's right that we pass a bill that not only offers a pardon, but also provides a mechanism to remove criminal records for behavior that is no longer illegal. Whether the law should be used to send a message is a debate for another day. In fact, tomorrow I may touch on this in the analysis of Lord Brackadale's hate crime report. But it must be true that if, and I hope when, this parliament stands united at five o'clock this evening to say it is right that all those who are convicted of same-sex sexual activity that is now legal or pardoned 
and that there be a mechanism be put in place to disregard the offence from cr criminal records, that that should send a powerful message about the commitment of this Parliament to counter prejudice. And incidentally, that message is very relevant. Annie Wells gave some statistics earlier on current discrimination. I'd like to add to that because I note that uh, sexual orientation aggravated crime is up 5% on last year. And with the exception of 2014-15, there have been year-on-year -year increase in charges reported since the introducing legislation in 2010. We must send the message, presiding officer, that says clearly and unequivocally that that is not acceptable and that Scotland is moving on from the prejudices of the past. Sticking with the message theme, in the stage one debate, I made the point about the importance of semantics, and indeed, Kezia Dugdale intervened to make the important and valid point that language matters in such discussions. I suggested, and the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged this in opening, that there is something to be said for the view that the use of the word pardon implies a pardoning, the forgiving, the excusing of a committed crime. And I recognise the point made in the Equality Network's briefing where an individual criticised the UK legislation saying to accept a pardon means you accept you were guilty. I was not guilty of anything. But I do acknowledge and concede Jamie Green's response to me at the time when he stated a pardon is a cancellation of a legal consequence of an offence or conviction. We need a pardon. Though I only concede it in the context of Daniel Johnson's powerful and accurate comments on exactly this point earlier today. In passing, I reference my comments about Victorian reluctance to name gross indecency from earlier, because for all that that may seem bizarre to us now, I think sometimes we remain reluctant to speak, speak honestly and openly about society and, and people. Throughout much of this process, and indeed reporting on it, I've noticed we sometimes talk about men who are in love and loving another adult or men attracted to each other. And I understand that, but as Kezia Dugdale correctly made clear in her intervention to me, there is no such thing as gay sex. It is just sex conducted by gay people. Correct. Many gay people have sex for no other reason than because they want to. So does everyone else. And we rarely search for an affectionate adjective to in some way validate that decision, and I don't think we should do it in any other context either. The second main limb is to give those convicted for these offences an opportunity to have them disregarded. This is important because whilst it is likely they will be spent convictions, they may thus be revealed in a higher level disclosure application. As the Justice Committee is seeing at this moment, simply having a conviction buried in the record can have a significant detrimental impact on employment prospects. So it does make sense that the record is not automatically wiped, as then matters which perhaps legitimately remain crimes could inadvertently be, re be removed. But that makes it imperative that the disregard process is extensively and positively communicated so all those who could be impacted know it is a necessary step and how to take it. The Equality Network is right to say it will be very important that the pardon and disregard and the difference between them is well publicised. And I note that Annie Wells sought at stage two to place the Scottish Government under a duty to raise awareness about the law but withdrew following an undertaking from the Minister that such publicity would be considered. I am sure that this consideration will not take long and it will yield suitably positive results. Furthermore, in the committee, Tim Hopkins suggested that because of the complexity of both the application form and the system, we estimate that only 2% of the people in England and Wales with those convictions who are still living have applied for the disregard. Therefore, whatever system is set up, it should be designed by government along with the key stakeholders to ensure it is user-friendly. That means a simple application form, a confidential, transparent, and easily understood process, and a speedy resolution. And I'm encouraged by the Cabinet Secretary's undertaking to keep the process and the bureaucracy to a minimum. In concluding then, I am happy to support this bill and look forward to voting in favour today, because let there be no doubt, the passing of this bill will mark a hugely important step, but only one step in the fight to address and show that Scotland is no longer willing to accept discrimination against LGBTI people in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Putin McGregor to be followed by Monica Lennon. Mr McGregor, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'll take this opportunity to remind the Chamber that I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, and I'm also a proud uh, member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee that scrutinised this legislation, at least from uh, stage two. Um, 
Today, I'm proud that we stand here to vote through legislation that in today's Scotland is a given, but only 30 or 40 years ago, we saw very different attitudes, resulting in the unfair and unjust prosecution of gay and bisexual men. As other members have already said, same-sex sexual activity between men was considered a criminal offence in Scotland as recently as 1980, the year in which I was born. I find this, that completely outrageous, and I'm thankful that we now live in a country that knows how wrong it was to criminalise this. I recently read a story presiding officer about how being homosexual was still officially considered an illness in Sweden by the National Board in the late 70s. In Sweden, we're actually fairly forward by decriminalising homosexuality in the 40s. However, protesters began to call in sick to work because they were gay, with one individual even being able to claim benefits for being gay. Needless to say, it was swiftly recognised that, in fact, being attracted to the same sex is not an illness. This may now sound ridiculous to many, but sadly, we were years behind this, which is simply inexcusable. Understandably, this legislation will not right this massive injustice. However, it sends out the message that it is not acceptable in today's society and individuals will no longer be hindered simply because their sexual partners are of the same gender. Our attitudes have changed, but we still require the Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill to automatically pardon the estimated 994 gay and bisexual men convicted under historical discriminatory laws and allow these past convictions to be legally disregarded. As the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his opening statement, we must remember that some feel that accepting a pardon means that you, you accept in some way that there is guilt, and this is not the aim of the bill. And anyone who is affected by these convictions have not done anything wrong, and it's important that we get that message out. This is why the, the inclusion of an apology, as well as a pardon, is crucial, and I again applaud our First Minister for her apology in November. We cannot erase these injustices, but this bill fully recognises that the convictions were wrong and discriminatory, and will ensure that disregards will be provided to those who wish them. The wrong has been committed by the state, not the individuals, and whilst the hurt and harm caused can never be undone, we can certainly now continue to work towards ensuring that such unjust practices never happen again. Sadly, there are those who are not alive today to see their conviction condemned and pardoned, but the family of those deceased people with those convictions now have the opportunity to apply to Scottish ministers for a letter that will explain the pardon and when it applies, setting out that the pardon convictions were wrongful and discriminatory, and will also include the First Minister's apology, apology as discussed at the Stage 2 debate in the committee. Hopefully this will be able to provide comfort to those families affected. We must also consider the de definition of sexual activity. In England and Wales, Wales, the bill there does not allow for the holding of hands and kissing in public to be considered as part of both the pardoned and the disregard provisions. This bill does provide that. And by providing the broader definition of sexual activity, balance has been sought and this will allow flexibility to ensure the bill covers all those who were affected by previous convictions. In committee, we heard evidence, well, I, I apologise, President Officer, I wasn't actually a committee member at that stage, but the committee heard evidence that was both shocking and heartbreaking. Individuals' lives, careers and future prospects have been hindered for something as simple as showing affection to their partner on the street. And the committee convener, Christina McKelvey, summed some of that evidence up very well in her speech. For example, hearing from a witness who was charged in the 80s with loitering in a public, uh, a public convenience under a bylaw. This witness detailed how the law did not specifically apply to homosexuals, but they believed the intention of the regulation was clearly aimed at gay men. Forty years later, this witness found that it came up in enhanced disclosure, and he was required to submit as part of a charitable work, much to his shock and surprise. This is indeed shocking, that a fine he was given that equals to around £2 in today's money was still affecting his employment or volunteering opportunities 40 years on. The witness detailed that he would be pursuing the disregard. We still have work to do towards LGBTI equality, that is for sure, President Officer, but I believe that we are taking the correct steps every day and that society is changing. It is worth reiterating, as I did previously at the Stage 1 debate, that the Scottish Social Attitude Survey reported that the percentage of people in Scottish society holding a positive view of same-sex relationships rose from 37% in 2000 to 69% in 2015, which does show progress. In addition to this, the percentage of people holding negative views towards those in same-sex relationships has decreased from 48% to 18% over the same period. There's no denying we have made progress, however, I still consider 18% far too high. If you identify as an LGBTI individual, then almost a fifth of people you meet do not support your sexual orientation, and this is simply not good enough. 
This is a global problem, though, as Annie Wells mentioned, in her speech, and in 72 countries, having a gay relationship is still considered a criminal offence. More shockingly, in a third of those countries, those in same-sex relationships can be prosecuted, jailed, or even executed. We have a responsibility to set an example to these countries and lead the way and continue to raise these issues. We've now ensured that legislation reflects equality and shows that discrimination is unacceptable. We should now reflect this as a wider society and show Scotland as a fully inclusive and equal country that it has the potential to be. We must ensure that this bill is well publicised and those who choose not to apply for a disregard will still have the comfort of knowing that they have received the pardon and the First Minister's apology. We live in a Scotland, presiding officer, where we celebrate our diversity and on Pride Month, let us pass this bill and move forward to true LGBTI equality. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Gail Ross. Miss Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Scottish Labour's Equality Spokesperson, I'm pleased to be part of the debate today. And I want to begin by paying tribute to organisations including the Equality Network, LGBT Youth Scotland and Stonewall Scotland for their tireless campaigning for equality for the entire LGBTI community. As others have done today, it is right to stress that these men did nothing wrong. Wrong was done to them. As has been pointed out, the word pardon might indicate that these men have committed a crime to be absolved of, but this is not true. A man loving another man has never been wrong. It was the state that was wrong. I therefore commend the First Minister's unqualified and unreserved apology for those laws and for the hurt and the harm that they caused so many people. And I thank her for doing so. In bringing forward this positive piece of legislation, we must not forget the very real and destructive impact that these historical convictions had. Men who were convicted under these laws were not able to live the life they would have free, freely chosen. And although women were not criminalised in the same way, the law further reinforced discrimination against lesbian or bisexual women, and they are part of this story too. We've heard what it was like to live with a criminal record or the fear of one and the incredible stigma that went with such convictions. The Equalities and Human Rights Committee heard witness A describe how he felt his employment chances and progression were hindered by his conviction, a conviction which was merely for kissing another man. Witness A did not apply for other jobs because he would be forced to detail this distressing information. What a missed opportunity and an injustice. We should all be upset, angry and sorry that countless men had their careers limited by this reprehensible legislation. The actual convictions tell only parts of the story. Gay and bisexual men lived in fear of conviction in a society that did not accept them. As Tim Hopkins of the Equality Network said, people lived in the shadow and fear of being discovered and prosecuted, so they had to live double lives. It is a sad fact that for many men, this remains an untold story because they have now passed away. As stated by Daniel Johnson and indeed other colleagues, um, my colleague Mary Fee has passionately fought for the rights of families to have the convictions of their late relatives pardoned. This includes, devastatingly, the families of men who say that their loved ones died by suicide as a consequence of the stigma of homosexuality. It is a terrible fact that nothing can be done to change this past. Today, I am glad we live in a Scotland that condemns discrimination and intolerance towards the LGBTI community. But we shouldn't be complacent because intolerant attitudes do remain. Most LGBT people would tell you they make a quick calculation about the environment that they are in before deciding whether or not to display even the smallest hint of affection towards a partner. The recent social media video for the BBC, Time for Love, showcased this very experience. It features a young man, Sean, and his partner holding hands as they walk through a park in Glasgow before having to decide whether or not to kiss goodbye in public. And the video shows the, the mental calculations, the looks from strangers and the consideration of what their reaction might be. All of that has to be processed before any action is taken. It reveals in a, a really effective way the pressure that is still exerted on young people, young gay people even today. Kissing your partner goodbye should be a spontaneous act. You shouldn't have to carry out a risk assessment. 
And just this week, I was horrified to read in, in the press about the experience of a, a gay couple in Cote Bridge, uh, in the region that I represent, physically attacked at a nightclub whilst out celebrating their engagement. So homophobia and intolerance in Scotland, unfortunately, it still exists in many parts of society. And we all have so much work to do to stamp out this unacceptable behaviour. The Time for Inclusive Education campaign, the Thai campaign, which many of us know, found that 90% of LGBT people experience bullying in schools. And over a quarter of those have attempted suicide as a result of the bullying. We need LGBTI inclusive education. And many of us are wondering uh, what we're still waiting for. And I, I um, share Patrick Harvey's sentiments around the, the need for, uh, for less patience on such matters. More must be done to tackle discrimination against the LGBTI community in Scotland. Scotland's improving record on legal equality is an important step. Since the establishment of the Scottish Parliament, Scotland has reached a high point for LGBT rights, uh, being recognised in 2015 and 2016 as the best country in Europe for LGBTI legal equality. From the introduction of civil partnerships for same-sex couples in 2005 to marriage equality in 2014, Scotland's achievements in LGBT rights have been hard fought and hard won. This should be an immense source of pride for all Scots, but especially the LGBTI Scots who led the way. In conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome this historical sexual offences, pardon and disregard Scotland bill and hope that its passing, accompanied by the First Minister's apology, is of comfort to the countless men affected by this harmful legislation and the LGBT community today who continue their fight for equality in Scotland and indeed across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I have been honoured to take part in all three stages of this bill and it is indeed a privilege to speak in this debate which will see it finally become law. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has helped us to get to this point. My fellow committee members, the Clarks, Spice, the Bill team, most of all those who gave evidence both in person and in writing. And I'd also like to put on record my recognition also for Tim Cop Hopkins of the Equality Network. I certainly found his help and input invaluable and I know my committee colleagues did as well. Monica Lennon mentioned the Thai campaign, and I know that Jordan and Liam do really, really fantastic work, both in schools and in our society. And they're all in the gallery here today, and to them I say thank you. I've been struck throughout this process by the consensual approach at every stage of this bill. During stage two last month, all members who put down amendments did so with the betterment of the bill in mind. And in almost every case, the Cabinet Secretary gave assurances of the action the government was taking to resolve any remaining issues. It's a testament to this approach that many of the amendments were actually withdrawn or not moved. During stage two, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed a number of further actions the government would take. This includes providing a mechanism for letters of comfort to be written to the close relatives of deceased men who cannot apply for disregards and are not alive to see themselves be pardoned. It's an unquestionable tragedy that not all those wronged can be pardoned while living, but such letters will allow families to have physical evidence that when it comes to historic sexual offences, it was the state that was wrong and not their relative and I thank my colleague, Mary Fee, for that. President Officer, at stage two, we were also grateful to be joined by Stuart Stevenson, whose insights can assist any piece of legislation. Stuart Stevenson's amendment provided for the situation where those applying for a disregard cannot supply the name or address they were using at the time of their wrongful conviction. Circumstances and the passage of time may mean that these men do not have this information. As a result of Stuart Stevenson, Stevenson's amendment, it will not act against them when applying for disregards. And for this, I thank him. In my stage one speech, I touched on the question of wrongfulness and the question of pardoning. 
And this was again discussed at stage two when Mary Fee raised the story of 94-year-old George Montague, who said that following the pardoning legislation in England and Wales, I will not accept a pardon. To accept a pardon means you accept that you were guilty. I was not guilty of anything. As I said before, a pardon is the correct legal remedy to apply in this situation. However, it is crucial for the sake of men like George that we do everything we can to go beyond the pardon. We must take every opportunity to explain that this legislation seeks to put right the misconduct of the state, not excuse misconduct of individuals. As George said, I was not guilty of anything. Like the First Minister, we must respond. We categorically, unequivocally and wholeheartedly apologise. I want again to raise an example of the power of this legislation, which I was pleased to see the Law Society describe as the strongest evidence for change in the law. And it's the case of Witness A, who had the bravery and selflessness to come before our committee and give evidence. People like Witness A, whose jobs require vulnerable groups or PVG checks, still live in fear that they are one promotion or job application away from a part of their personal life being on display to their employers. Once this legislation has passed, such men can apply for disregards which will not only confirm the wrongfulness and discriminatory nature of their convictions, but will confine the historic wrong done against them to the past and prevent these wrongs being a part of their future. Once they have a disregard, they will no longer have to put off applying for a promotion for fear of an employer finding out about their unjust conviction, and they will no longer, longer have to choose between their career or protecting their personal life. <coughs> we will never be able to fully compensate for the historical wrongs enacted on men like Witness A and many, many others, but we must make it as easy as possible for them to move on. We must sweep this remnant of the past from our law and we must continue to say we are sorry. President officer, this is an historic day, but we do still have a long way to go, as many of my colleagues have said, and I commend everyone that works for equality and acceptance in society. And I will be exceptionally proud to vote to pass this bill at decision time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, often when we get to stage three of debates uh, and there is a uh, broad consensus across the chamber, uh, sometimes those debates lose a bit of their passion. I think uh, listening to members from right across the chamber today, one of the most powerful things I take away is how strongly uh, people feel about this issue. I've just uh, joined the Equalities Committee, but listening to uh, members who've sat through uh, witnesses' uh, evidence, it, you know, it, it's really uh, very uh, evident how uh, they've been affected by, by what they heard. Uh, and you know, those, those stories really are truly appalling. I think as well, it's very much welcome to hear the tone set by the Cabinet Secretary right at the start of today's debate. I think it would be very easy to be patting ourselves on the back and looking uh, at this, uh, rightly so, uh, as, as a historic moment, as a very significant moment and one uh, the Parliament uh, as a whole can be very proud of. But in, in, in uh, adopting solely that approach, it would be missing something uh, because there are many people, as several members from across the chamber have already touched upon, for whom uh, today's decision uh, comes too late. Um, and like uh, Daniel Johnson, you know, I, I recognise this was an opportunity uh, for uh, reflection. And when I looked back at the changes that have happened uh, in my own uh, lifetime, it's, it's quite sad in a way because I imagine uh, that in 28 years' time, there will be other people sitting in this chamber who look back on today's decision and wonder why it came so late. Um, and there's no real answer or justification uh, for that. And I think that when I apologize uh, to those who've been affected uh, and have had their lives destroyed by the laws of our country, that, that, that's what I'm saddest and most sorry about because there is no reason uh, why it took so long. We knew and it was widely accepted uh, back um, 
you know, through various decades um, and the fact that we've got into another millennium uh, without addressing this, to me, it is sad. But that's not to uh, undermine uh, the incredible work that's been taken forward by people across uh, the parliament, by the government. Uh, and again, like many members, I welcome the constructive uh, approach the government's taken, not just to listening to uh, members uh, from across the parties, but for listening to external uh, stakeholders, many of whom have brought real life knowledge from beyond uh, the parliament. I also think it is important to recognise there's still far more to do. Uh, as a new member uh, of the Equalities Committee, I'm very much uh, looking forward uh, to working collaborati collaboratively uh, in this spirit with other members to drive forward equality. Uh, because again, I think there's no room for complacency. As several members have touched upon, and we've got the uh, Thai campaign here in the gallery, the level of homophobic bullying uh, in our schools in Scotland and the experiences of young people living today is, is, is truly uh, shocking. Um, and it's something uh, that I, I just, again, can't believe uh, still exists. Uh, but it does, um, and I think Fulton McGregor uh, drew attention uh, to some of the attitude surveys. I can't understand uh, why uh, the, the results come back that way. It's not something that people talk about. It's not something uh, you hear. Um, and I think uh, you know, it, it's, it's something that's been pushed, big, bigoted views have been pushed out uh, of, of the public domain. Um, and that's where I sort of say as sensitively to, to Patrick Harvey, and I fully uh, agree uh, with, with many of the points uh, that, that he made. Uh, my, my views are not uh, dissimilar to his own uh, on, on these issues. Uh, but I think we have to be very careful uh, as a parliament, uh, as a society, not to push bigoted views uh, out of, 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 of the limelight. Um, and I think that one of the good things uh, about our voting system here is that people's uh, decision making is publicly recorded and I'll quite frankly, I'll quite frankly take anyone's vote uh, provided it moves equality forward. I don't, uh, I don't care what the justification uh, is for that. And I think actually it's quite telling because uh, I think the public pressure is now on people to justify the stances that they take. And I don't think as a society that we're all that far away from a point where it won't be up to party leaders to try and prevent people with bigoted views uh, from, from continuing to, to stand for election. I think uh, the population as a whole uh, will, will be ready to force those people out of public light. Yes? Patrick Harvey. To the member for giving way. Is there, and I, I appreciate the, 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 the tone with which he, he makes his remarks, is there a reason in principle, though, why someone who sincerely believes that interracial marriage is wrong and should be forbidden by law should be unacceptable in the political realm, but someone who believes that same-sex marriage is wrong and should be forbidden by law uh, should be more welcome. Is there a principal reason for a difference in the way that we uh, value those, those different positions? Oliver Mundell. In, in, in my own personal view, no, uh, and that's what I say. I, I, I'm inclined to agree with Patrick Harvey, but I think if we're going to win over uh, people's hearts and minds, if we're going to progress these causes forward, we have to be big enough, tolerant enough uh, to have those debates in public, uh, not to make people feel that they can't express uh, their moral views. I think it's important, again, to recognise a distinction between views that people hold within their own moral uh, compass or conscience uh, and those uh, which are recognised in our laws. Um, and I think that we have to have a debate. We're not going to convince uh, the significant percentage of people uh, who do have problems uh, with, with LGBT rights uh, that they should change their mind simply by shouting them down. Uh, we need to make the positive case for equality. I think that's what we're voting for tonight. And I'm very proud uh, that the parliament as a whole has come to that point. And I hope uh, tonight's vote's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mundell. Paul Stewart-Stevenson to be followed by Pauline McNeill, please. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. I'm an accidental uh, participant in this debate. Um, 
when the stage one debate came forward, the, the whips found uh, there were one short in the volunteers to participate, and I got uh, that tap on the shoulder to do so. And I did what I always do uh, in, under these circumstances, particularly when the last speaker at the end of a debate, I went and read the bill. And that's why I was able to identify a little something uh, that I was delighted to bring forward at stage two, that I'm absolutely delighted. I've heard two acknowledgements from colleagues uh, for that little bit. But I, I'm afraid when, as I have, you have attended 266 Justice Committee meetings, as I have, you kind of have learned how to read bills quite quickly and to spot where the elephant traps are. Uh, there is not a special skill, it's just length of service and you'll all be able to do it when you've done 266 uh, justice committees as well and I wish you well of that prospect uh, but uh, there we are. I think it's very unusual this stage three debate. Um, we have no amendments that in itself is not particularly unusual but I think the Business Bureau has served as well as a parliament by extending the period for the debate to fill a full debate slot. That may be unique, it's certainly pretty unusual. And I uh, very much welcome that comprehensive opportunity for a much wider range of people than usual to participate in the, 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 the stage three debate. Now, uh, just a, a few things. Uh, we're not here to rewrite the past because that's just not simply uh, something that we can do. And any attempts to do that sort of thing are the sort of things that require the most careful of uh, considerations. I don't, for example, much like the renaming of streets in an attempt to rewrite history. I may support the removal of celebratory statues. For example, Felix Dzerzhinsky, who used to gaze across Dzerzhinsky Square at the back of Red Square uh, to the Lubyanka, is no longer there, and that street's no longer called Dzerzhinsky Square. Uh, and I think that's proper, given the abuses of human rights that he, uh, as the uh, founder of the precursor uh, to the KGB, uh, oversee. But I do like writing the effects of wrongs uh, that were made in the name of the, the, the state. Uh, we do not forget that that happened, but we can offer some, some redress. There is an issue that uh, we can't really legislate for in any meaningful sense, which we should bear in mind, that we may be striking the official record from public gaze, but the newspapers will still carry many uh, reports of convictions and prosecutions. Um, hopefully uh, that uh, does not, uh, not, not interfere uh, with what we are doing today. Now, presenting officer, I do want to touch on some of the uh, debate that's uh, preceded me. Um, it's worth saying we're all making a journey. Um, my parents were both Edwardians, born well before the First World War, and their moral compass and their view of society would have been very different from that which I hold and which uh, we are expressing this afternoon. My youngest grandparent was born in 1872 at a time when women couldn't even own property. Uh, so the world changes, society uh, evolves. And I think in, in, in that context, um, I want to just gently engage uh, with Patrick Harvey. I don't think we can bully anybody into changing their point of view. It just doesn't work in politics uh, or in life. I think that, that there's possibly uh, a five-stage process we might consider, and I've just jotted this down so it's capable of being criticised. Step one, get people to recognise there's a difference. Step two, get people to acknowledge that difference. Step three, get people to engage with that difference. Step four, get people to celebrate that difference. And step five, get people to promote the positive values of difference. Now that is not simply about today's debate, it's about how we progress people step by step to a new view of the world. And I encourage Patrick Harvey to consider perhaps that rather than bullying those who might have a particular viewpoint, we find a way of engaging with them uh, to, 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 I'm not going to, sorry. Um, now, 
it, it, it's also worth just returning to Alan Turing, one of my great heroes. Um, Alan Turing uh, lives on in computer science uh, as uh, the, the name of the Turing test. And the Turing test is a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior. And I think that's exactly what we are doing today, exhibiting intelligent behavior. Uh, so I very, much, uh, I very much welcome this bill coming forward. I very much welcome uh, the work of Tim Hopkins, who's probably almost the first lobbyist I met when I came to this parliament in 2001. And do you know, it doesn't look a day older. It's really <laughs> absolute. So, so see what nice people are doing. No, no. Presiding officer, I hope you didn't hear that. Um, that, that. He doesn't look a day older, and yet he should for his indefatigable efforts uh, to, to, to help us and to help me as someone who came from an Edwardian family, not naturally equipped for today's debate to a position where I not only can engage in all stages of this debate, but with gladness in my heart, vote for this bill at decision time. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, presiding officer, I confess too that I had a tap on the shoulder. I never counted how many justice committees I've been to, but I think it has been a lot. I also confess that I didn't read the bill. Um, but I've heard the news all day. I've been following the debate since it started. And to some extent, what I have to say is my feelings emotionally about what we are doing today. Because it is a sad day in so many ways. Because we hear of the tragedy of our history, the stories of gay men who were wrongly criminalised for living their lives freely and the role that the state played in criminalizing them and destroying their lives. But it is a significant day too, as we use the powers of this Scottish Parliament to right a serious wrong in our society and in our history. I'm learning this afternoon what a wonderful job the committee has done in making sure that this bill we pass tonight is probably just right. And I agree that finding the right words to use in this debate has been difficult. And I recognise how we have wrestled with this. There are no words, really, which are going to be adequate to describe what we really mean by passing this bill. But we've settled on an automatic pardon for all those convicted. But those words are hugely significant to all of us here because we know that it addresses a shameful past the misery and the heartbreak that our society has caused to men living and deceased, their loved ones and their families. As others have said, we can never change that, but we can recognise how very wrong our country was in those times. And we as politicians can only fight to ensure a better future. The First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, many others deserve praise for the formulation of this legislation they brought forward because it is wider than the legislation in England and Wales. The Human Rights Committee, the Equality Network and former leader, Le uh, Le Labour leader Kezia Dugdale was many of the politicians who made an early call for action. All of you, I think, deserve praise. Every time we debate equality about the sexual orientation, it brings home, I think, how recent and disgraceful the discrimination was in our country, and many speakers have talked about it. It reminds us of how hard we still have to work to be a society, a modern society, free from discrimination. There are many upsetting stories from this dark past which expose the horror of state crimes against individuals, but also the insanity of this treatment. So I'm the third speaker to mention the wonderful Dr. Alan uh, Turing and I hope Christina McKelvey won't mind if I mention him again because to me this wonderful man who whose work was only released to the public scrutiny in 2012 this is a man who encrypted the Enigma machine this is a man who helped us win the second world war and we know what happened to him and we're only just learning about him so you know that he was pardoned given a royal pardon from the Queen finally so today we remember not just Alan, all the men wrongly convicted. 
and we debate the passing of this bill tonight. And I believe we stand as a parliament. I will in a minute. I just wanted to make this point and I will be glad to take it because I hope the member would agree. We stand as a parliament, not as individual parties, but as people tonight. I think with perhaps maybe one exception, I don't know, but the rest of us will vote as individuals because what we believe we're doing tonight is right and I'd be delighted to take an intervention. Derek Mackay. I don't have the privilege of being able to speak in this debate because of my ministerial uh, position, so I'm not one of the ones lucky enough to have a speaking slot, but I appreciate the opportunity to have an intervention and I, th I thank Pauline McNeill for that. It, this is an opportunity to right the wrongs of the past, but there's something else really important for today and going into the future as well, and that's setting the cultural norms. Parliamentarians don't normally set them. Uh, we set the laws, but culture is so important in this regard because we address the mistakes of the state of the past. We also say as a parliament, I'm sure united, that it is okay for uh, a gay and lesbian couples to walk with their partner down the street and not live in fear of being ridiculed, spat upon, attacked or otherwise, which unfortunately still happens to this day. So this is our opportunity to unite as a parliament to address our future as well as our past. I, I, I can allow member, you extra time. Thank Polly you. Whitney. And I thank the member very much for that important intervention, because I think that view is shared, that we must be as leaders in whatever level we serve a fundamental point that you make, I agree with, it's about every single person has the right to live the life that they choose and the state should protect that right in every way and that's why we must stand up as a parliament and take that on. I learned today for the first time, I did not realise that these uh, so-called past offences were appearing in disclosure checks. I'm actually quite shocked to learn that this has still happened in recent times. Uh, other members have talked about how recent our past laws have been uh, in the way in which we criminalised sex between men under 21 until the 1980s, and it was only in 2001 that we equalised the age of consent. It really just shows you how lax we have been on the question of equality. But I do want to mention, in closing, presiding officer, another great day in this parliament, and some will remember this, in June 2000, uh, where we reversed the Section 28, which prevented any local authority from giving any funding to the promotion of homosexuality. But I will never forget that time and that period in our history, because in some ways it was a dark time. Those people who remember it will remember the swell of opinion against this parliament doing it. And big money went behind that campaign. I'm glad to see I think we've moved on substantially from that time, but we can't forget that it did happen. In closing, presiding officer, I just wanted to make this point. 37% of the United Nations member countries have laws discriminating against lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual and intersex people. 37%. We haven't even had a chance to discuss the discrimination. Uh, in fact, lesbians are not really mentioned in the legislation at all, perhaps for another day. There's work to do across the globe. But I will be proud tonight to vote with everyone else in this parliament, regardless of party, and quite proud to be doing something worthwhile today. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you very much, presenting officer. Presenting officer, I am happy to be speaking in this important debate this afternoon, and uh, I want to put my record, uh, my thanks to everyone who has actually been involved in bringing the bill to this stage. At the outset, uh, I would like to quote from the briefing that we received from the Equality Network. I believe that this quote says so much about this bill, the journey that society has actually been on, but more importantly, the journey that our fellow citizens have travelled to make Scotland a more inclusive and tolerant country. Uh, the quote is this, this bill, together with the First Minister's apology, are an important and appropriate response to the wrong that was committed against so many people under these past discriminatory laws. The bill uh, cannot, of course, undo the harm already caused by that discrimination, uh, not only to those who were convicted, but also to those who lived under the shadow of criminalisation and to the LGBT people uh, more widely uh, through the law giving the green light to widespread discrimination and prejudice. And finally, nevertheless, the bill is a very welcome piece of the jigsaw of measures needed 
to address the discrimination of the past and present. Saying also, this statement alone for me highlights exactly why this legislation is needed. I welcome the cross-party support for the legislation and also welcome the recognition that this bill is long overdue. But clearly, and as others have, uh, have mentioned today, section one of the bill is that clear statement of intent about what the legislation actually aims to achieve. Now that, that section one, and I'll quote this, uh, the purpose of this act is to acknowledge the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of past convictions for certain historical sexual offences by pardoning persons who have been convicted of those offences and also be providing for a process for convictions for those offences to be disregarded. Now, once again, the briefing from the Equality Network was hugely supportive and also highlighted how far this legislation is going as compared to that of Westminster. The, the unreserved apology from the First Minister in November certainly laid out in no uncertain terms how important this bill actually was for this government, but also something that this whole Parliament could support. Well, nothing that this Scottish Parliament does uh, can erase these injustices of the past. It's hoped that the First Minister's apology, alongside this new bill, uh, can provide some comfort to those who endured them. For people convicted of same-sex sexual activity, which is now legal, uh, the wrong has been committed by the state, not by the individuals. The individuals deserve that unqualified apology, as well as the pardon. And that's why Section 1, in addition to the First Minister's unreserved apology, are so important. Something also, Scotland has came a long way in many aspects of life. There are, of course, challenges daily, and there always will be in every single country, with every government, and also with every legislature. We in Scotland, uh, sometimes it seem to be the world champions, however, at beating ourselves up. Even when we do something remarkable, there are many, and I'm sure we've all said it, many people will just shrug their shoulders and say, we did all right. Well, today, this Parliament, every one of us who votes for this bill at five o'clock will do something that's more than just all right. We'll do something remarkable, knowing full well, however, that the journey to equality is not yet complete. It's happened due to political leadership across all the parties, but also societal change. In just over 15 years, the Scottish Social Attitude Survey has shown that as of 2015, the number of people in, Sc in Scottish society holding a positive view of same-sex relationships had risen from 37% in 2000 to 69% by 2015, while those holding negative views had decreased from 48% to 18% over the same period. And considering also how recently discriminatory laws were in force, it's remarkable but also inspiring that Scotland is now considered to be one of the most progressive countries in Europe when it comes to LGBTI equality. The ILGA Europe's annual Rainbow Europe Index, it doesn't rank Scotland separately from the UK, but it would place Scotland as second in the 2018 based on the current laws and policies. And also in the 2015 Rainbow Europe Index, Scotland was the best country in Europe for LGBTI legal equality. Now, it was this Scottish Government that introduced the historic same-sex marriage legislation, and when it was passed by this Parliament, it was recognised by many as being amongst the most progressive in the world. And it was this SNP Government that also had committed to reviewing and reforming gender recognition law so that it's in line with international best practice for people who are transgender or intersex. And, presenting officer, if it was any other party undertaking these actions, I would equally be proud of them. These, these are the right things to do. But during the stage one debate, I concluded uh, my comments uh, highlighting a person I knew. Uh, the person has uh, sadly passed away, he passed away a few years ago, and he was uh, an intensely private man. Now, with no need uh, or desire uh, to know anything uh, about him, about his business, but we all knew him to be committed to two things. First of all, independence, but secondly, he was gay. Now, he'd be delighted today. Uh, he'd be in the gallery, uh, smiling, uh, and quietly reflecting on his journey, uh, that of his friends and the journey ahead, but he would also be on the phone tomorrow to tell me what's next to be done uh, on this particular journey. Now, tonight at five o'clock, I'm voting for him and the respect that he always showed others and also the respect that he is due from society and the political class that once was so intolerant but is now moving forward. Now, in conclusion, presenting officer, uh, I believe that the, the comments from the Law Society of Scotland during the earlier process of the bill is accurate and also just. And they stated 
Scotland is a tolerant society and is fully committed to respecting, protecting and implementing human rights and demonstrating equality, dignity and respect. The introduction of this bill endorses that position. That is the type of Scotland I am proud to live in. That's the type of Scotland I want my daughters to grow up in. And that's the type of Scotland I want every citizen of our country to experience. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corey to be followed by Richard Lyle. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. May I also extend my thanks as well to everyone who has brought this bill to Stage 3 this afternoon. Now, I welcome the chance to speak today in this Stage 3 debate for the most, this most important piece of legislation. At Stage 1 of this bill, I've spoken to the debate in this Parliament, taking the next step in the process of righting a wrong. And now we've taken the final step on this particular journey at decision time this evening. Whilst, of course, this is an important step, and the one that we should take when we vote later on today could even be considered an historic moment. I think it is worth reflecting that this does, not come, that this does come too late for many, and that the hurt and discrimination felt by those affected, their families and their loved ones, can never, ever be removed. I am also sure that those who receive these disregards and pardons will be able to take some solace from the fact that we and the whole of society recognize what we, they went through was wrong and that we are doing the very best we can on behalf of society to show contrition. At stage one, I spoke of the changing attitudes we are seeing in Scotland towards equality. During that debate, I spoke about the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey of 2015, which showed in just over 15 years a number of people in Scottish society holding a positive view of same-sex relationships had risen to 69%, as mentioned already. Those holding negative views decreased to 18% over the same period. In the Stage 1 debate, I and others spoke about, the insur that it, about ensuring that the needs of the families of those men who, who were convicted who had sadly passed away were considered, whether through the creation of a certificate or a lottery of acknowledgement of the pain caused, so that that some comfort and closure for the loved ones of deceased men with such convictions could be offered. I was glad that such an amendment was brought forward at stage two by Mary Fee, that it would have allowed that to happen. The amendment was withdrawn after the Justice Secretary confirmed that the Scottish Government is going to have an administrative rather than a statutory scheme in place to enable relatives of a deceased person to receive a letter of comfort. I do think it is a good and positive conclusion to this part of the debate for all involved and will bring that comfort and closure for families. Additionally, I was glad to read in the official report of stage two that the letters of, to families and relatives will be signed by the First Minister, none, none other than the First Minister. I think that those letters being signed by the most senior member of the Scottish Government does send a clear and strong signal of the importance that this country places on the righting this wrong. As this bill now moves forward from proposal towards becoming law of the land, the focus is now on the Scottish Government to ensure that the administration of the disregards and pardon system is sound. Raymond McIntyre, a criminal records manager with Police Scotland said, it was about getting the right people involved in deciding how we structure the process and go about it. So it will be important, as this committee has already recommended, that the government cooperate and work closely with stakeholders in the design of this system. Police Scotland have already said that their view that the system needs to be clear and efficient. Det Detective Superintendent Houston stated that the application system should be a clear, efficient and quick process when a request comes in for a record search in respect of a disregard process. I agree, and I'm sure all members here would agree as well. It would be interesting to hear from the Minister later on during their summing up as to what steps and discussions have already been made, taken in this regard, and additionally, whether any additional resources are going to be made available to Police Scotland to set up such a system and do the work. The work with stakeholders will also need to extend towards ensuring that the disregard scheme is as user-friendly as possible so that no one is put off applying. I do think that the amendment which Stuart Stevenson brought forward inserting a caveat to the requirement uh, that those applying for disregard provide their name and address in, at the time. I think that this caveat, in cases where people are unable to remember where exactly they're living due to being such a long time ago, is a very helpful one, and I commend them for bringing it forward in making the scheme easier to access. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I'm glad to have had this opportunity to speak in today's important debate and to vote for this legislation this evening that will take Scotland a further step towards true equality for all our citizens in Scotland. I am sure that Alan Turing will be proud of us today. The last of the open debate contributions is from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to contribute to this most important of debates and what I consider, consider to be a historic moment for Scotland in our journey towards creating a more equal country for all. And the question that I've heard asked is, why are we bringing forward this legislation? The answer is simple. It is clear and it's absolutely right that we across this chamber want to address the absolute injustice that people experience simply because of their sexual orientation, for being who they are, for being themselves. And this bill will help ensure that together we address that historic wrong. How does that, the bill do that? It does so by providing a form of redress against the discriminatory effect of convicting men for same-sex sexual offences in the past, for activity that is now legal. It is the case that this legislation has both a symbolic and practical value, providing an automatic pardon to men convicted of same-sex sexual activity that would now be legal and enabling men to apply to have such convictions removed from central criminal conviction records. In two ways it does so, presiding officer, as it shall pardon those who are convicted of criminal offences for engaging in same-sex sexual activity, which is now legal. As I have stated, it shall but also put in place a system to enable a person with such a conviction to apply to have it disregarded, so that information about that conviction held in records, generally maintained by Police Scotland, does not show up in a disclosure check. This is so important to so many. The information held on police records is a matter of great concern. Just recently, I had an experience of a case, not related to the subject today, but related to a young woman who is now seeking to become a teacher, but was historically incorrectly recorded for a conviction of an adult when she should have been handled as a child. It was so many years ago, but it still hindered her ambitions to become a teacher. With the conviction showing up time and time again, due to my persistence, thankfully Police Scotland have now changed their reading and, retent and retention rules. And my constituent can look forward to not having this information displayed and getting on with her life. I was very happy to help my constituent get on with her life. And that is why many men with those historical and discriminatory offences will now feel relief and the ability to get on with their lives. This bill, which sees pardon, sends an unequivocal message to everyone convicted of an offence for an activity which is now legal. The law should not have treated them as criminals and they should not now be considered to be criminals. Instead, the Scottish Par Parliament recognises that a wrong was done to them. Presiding officer, I am proud that Scotland is a very different place than it was 30 or 40 years ago in terms of attitudes held by much of the population towards same-sex sexual activity. But the extremity effect of these laws lingers on. Indeed, until recently, the criminal law in Scotland discriminated against same-sex sexual activity between men, with same-sex sexual activity between men in itself a criminal offence in all circumstances as late as 1980. This law applied wherever the activity took place, including, for example, private homes. It was only in January 2001 that the age of consent for sexual activity between men and sexual activity between opposite sex pa uh, partners was equalised at 16. And there have also been many other examples of laws which could have been used in a discriminatory ma manner, including in common law. As I alluded to earlier, whilst it's overwhelmingly likely that such historical convictions will be spent, convictions under the Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation of the Offenders Act 1974, and so would not be disclosed at a basic dis level disclosure, it's still possible that these convictions could be disclosed when a person applies for a role for which a higher level disclosure certificate is required and therefore cannot be accepted in our modern progressive Scotland. This parliament, this place, during the time I've been 
a parliamentary, uh, parliamentarian, has done so many th amazing things in past legislation which truly changes lives. And I hope today it will be another such example. It also provides an opportunity belong beyond legislation to send a clear message to communities across Scotland. And I believe that our First Minister, as already has been said, did something which legislation in itself cannot do, and that was provide an apology to, par to Parliament. In that apology, the, Prime Minister uh, sorry, the First Minister uh, stated, and I quote, those laws criminalise the act of loving another adult. They deter people from being honest about their identity to families, friends, neighbours and colleagues. I'm proud. I'm proud to be in the SNP that has committed to reviewing, reforming gender recognition law. So it's in line with international best practice for people who are transgender or intersex. When considering this action, I think often of a speech I heard at an SNP conference made by a young person who spoke of their requirement to identify as either a man or a woman on a form and not knowing what they had to put down because they didn't necessarily identify with either. We need to deliver for our communities and ensure that this isn't, a, this isn't the situation for which young people or anyone is faced. That's why I will certainly be supporting the government in their uh, further legislation, which I'm sure they'll bring on in regard to transgender. I notice I'm running out of time, so, President Officer, I'd like to end by stating how much I valued hearing the contributions made by my colleagues from across the, the Parliament, and I look forward to supporting this bill later on this afternoon. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Mary Fee for a, a relaxed seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you kindly, Presiding Officer. Um, as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I am very pleased to have the opportunity to close this afternoon's debate on this very historic piece of legislation on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. And I too would like to take this opportunity to thank my fellow committee members and the committee clerks for their diligence throughout the legislative process. I would also, as others have done, I would like to put on record my personal thanks to Tim Hopkins of the Equality Network for his continuing help and support, not just throughout this piece of legislation, but throughout any piece of LGBTI um, legislation. Tim Hopkins is very much our go-to person. I'd also, I mean, I would like to particularly thank Tim for the support that he gave me during the passage of this bill, particularly in relation to the amendment stages of this bill. And this afternoon's debate has been a very consensual one and has shown the power of this Scottish Parliament to make real change and meaningful change when there is a clear commitment and a clear consensus from all sides of our chamber. And we have heard a range of very emotional and very passionate speeches in support of the bill this afternoon. And, presiding officer, it would be difficult in the relatively short, I know it's relaxed, but it's still relatively short time available to me to fully reflect all of the contributions in, in today's debate. But speeches from across the chamber have reflected the support that this legislation has and have, we have clearly recognised the need to correct a historic wrong. I would, however, like to mention Derek Mackay's very brief um, intervention, which I do think gave a very accurate description of where we've been and what we still need to do. And I know Derek Mackay doesn't get the opportunity to speak very often, and I am grateful he took the opportunity to intervene um, today. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I mean, I, I do share the, the concern that Patrick Harvey raised about the pace of change and how long it takes um, for cultural change to take place. And I too would like to see change move at a faster pace. But we are on a journey and I think we're, we're moving along a pace. I, I don't think, presiding officer, I have ever stood to close for these benches and said that I have felt honoured and proud to be part of a debate. But today, presiding officer, I am. And I would like to take this opportunity to place on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice for his very constructive engagement 
during my proposed amendments at the stage to, um, two. I proposed an amendment, as other people have mentioned, to the bill for the Scottish Government to provide a letter of comfort to the families of deceased people with convictions for historical sexual offences. And this was an issue that I had raised throughout our evidence sessions. And the hurt and the damage that has been done to both individuals and their families was something that both the Equality Network and myself were keen to find a way to resolve. And after receiving assurances from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and an assurance that dialogue would continue on this matter with the Equality Network, I withdrew my amendment. And I am extremely pleased that the Scottish Government will look to put in place an administrative process that will provide the relatives of a deceased person a letter of comfort. And most importantly, I think, each letter will be personally signed by the First Minister, giving a clear commitment that a wrong has been done to their relative. The Historic Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Bill is a historic and a very critical piece of legislation. And it is right that we acknowledge that Scots law acted in a repressive manner in its treatment of gay men. The law in Scotland until recently actively criminalised and discriminated against thousands and thousands of men on the basis of their sexual orientation. This bill admits that the state was unequivocally wrong to treat gay men as criminals. However, this bill also says much about the country we aspire to be. This bill makes an important statement that Scotland is a country that firmly rejects discrimination and celebrates our LGBTI community and supports them to be full and equal citizens who are treated with respect. In a global context, it is important to remember that although progress has been fought for and won by the LGBTI community, same-sex relationships are still criminalised in 72 countries and punishable by death in eight countries. Even in countries where same-sex relationships are legal, such as Egypt and Russia, gay men and gay women continue to experience significant discrimination, significant harassment and significant stigmatisation. The battle for LGBTI equality has no borders. And it is important that Scotland continues to play a constructive role on the international stage by promoting LGBTI equality and denouncing all examples of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. And it's also important that the pardon and the disregard in this bill and the difference between them is well publicised. As the Equality Network pointed out in their briefing, there will be many people with these convictions who are not in contact with LGBT organisations. So I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to work with LGBTI organisations to publicise the pardon and the disregard, including to those who live in rural and remote communities. And, Presiding Officer, in coming to a close, it's evident that the legacy of these convictions, fines and warnings as a result of the discriminatory laws prohibiting sexual activity between two men in Scotland have had an enduring, a damaging and a hurtful impact on thousands and thousands of men's lives. This bill cannot undo the discrimination and persecution experienced by these men. However, I hope that the pardon and the disregard system outlined in this bill and the letter of apology from the First Minister, which the Scottish Government have committed to providing, can provide the families of deceased men with a small degree of comfort. And finally, Presiding Officer, I will be proud to cast my vote tonight in favour of the historic sexual offences, pardons and disregards bill at decision time. Thank you. I call Jamie Green for an equally relaxed state minute. I'm very relaxed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to open my comments today, perhaps unusually, uh, by reading from a book. 
Um, I can't recall, to be honest, if I picked this up in a Soho bookshop after a few too many sherries, or if it was gifted to me uh, by a friend with a sense of dark humor. But this little book is called Homosexuality. It was written by Dr. Donald J. West, a renowned uh, psych psychiatrist in 1955. And it was published by Penguin Books, that well-known publisher that produced great such as Pride and Prejudice and Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. And as far as gay guides go, well, it's, it's not a great read. But I dare say in the 1950s, it was all rather enlightening, educational, perhaps even groundbreaking. So let me read from chapter 10, entitled Cause, Cure and Treatment. Given a simple choice, no one in his right mind would choose to be a homosexual. However strongly they protest their freedom from conventional morality, sexual, sexual deviants cannot escape a lurking guilt. The fact that many decent folk regard them as moral lepers renders them furtive and unsure, or else forces them into flaunting bravado. Whilst they wear no visible crutches, their disability is very real. The large number of otherwise respectable men arrested for loitering in public lavatories gives some indication of the depths of frustration to which many will sink. Now, sorry, also, we cannot go back and change the past, neither deeds nor attitudes. And it's fair to say that the views which seem so absurd to us in this 60-year-old book were quite normal then. Indeed, as I read the book, there's a tone of sympathy about it, perhaps even an earnest desire to understand this condition of homosexuality. They looked at it from a medical point of view, a psychoanalytical point of view, perhaps even a Freudian point of view. But today, the slogans on the t-shirts we wear at Pride say, we're gay, get over it. Or as Liam Kerr said, there's no such thing as gay sex, it's just sex. So in passing this bill today, we should remember the gross injustices faced by tens or thousands of men who suffered at the hands of legal, social and political discrimination on the grounds of who they chose to love, to kiss, to meet or to sleep with. And if Mr. George Montague will not accept our pardon, can I say to him, please accept our apology at the very least. The bill is what it is. It is a pardon. It is a disregard. It is an apology. And to some, the bill that we passed this evening is nothing more than symbolic. And it's right that that be the case. But to others, this bill is also a practical step forward to alter criminal records which have held them back in life. And even today are causing pain and misery to so many. But this afternoon, as we sit here in our modern parliament, being televised live, it is very easy to scorn and mock the lawmakers of the past. But I would say this, it is misguided to simply look <coughs> back with a sense of 21st century moral superiority and some sort of faux confusion about how on earth people could have said things like this or acted in such a way. What seems old fashioned to us today was righteous and relevant to so many in the bygone years. Perhaps we will look as draconian and unacceptable to the next generation as the duffel-coated, bowler-hatted generation of this book. They were different times and they were different people. But we are different times and we are different people. Well, most of us, anyway. And I say this not in mitigation of the appalling views that we seek to make amends for today, but to point out that at five o'clock this evening, our job is not yet done. Our job has only just started. Names eponymous with the history of gay rights, such as Lord Montague of Bewley, Alan Turing, Oscar Wilde, Harvey Milk, Wolfenden, Carl Ulrichs, Larry Kramer, Audrey Lord, Barbara Gittings, they've been joined by modern names, such as Terence Higgins, Peter Tatchell, Albert Kennedy, even modern icons and role models, such as George Takai or Ellen DeGeneres, organizations such as Stonewall, the Equality Network, LGBT Youth Scotland, and the Thai Campaign. And yes, for that matter, let us add Scotland PLC to that list. We may have lost our spot at the top of the Europe report on equality to Malta, I should add, but we have made legal progress in Scotland, if not social. And perhaps at this point I could, with the permission of time, touch upon the only thorn in the bush of today's debate, which has been otherwise quite consensual, and that is the important issue around moral choice, religious freedom, the law, and how we vote as individuals in this parliament. Now, I've been out for 22 years, and it's fair to say I've come across many people in my life who hold strong religious views against my sexuality. And it's not restricted to the Christian faith either. Now, some of these people have been business clients, some have been colleagues, some have been neighbors, dare I say even acquaintances. 
And providing their views as intolerant as I find them, I've always found a way to find a mutual common ground for respect with the majority of these people. I don't throw my private life in their face, but nor do I expect them to throw their views in mine. We must listen to each other if we are to make progress. I've got a lot to get through, Mr Harvey. The passing of today's bill is a chapter in the righting the wrongs of the past, and it is important, but it is not enough in itself. We may think we are beacons of modern liberalism and acceptance today, but perhaps in decades to come, people, people will look back at us and wonder why we are still having debates in this parliament about a society and a culture in 2018 in which a third of young LGBTI people in Scotland have been the victim of hate crime as a result of their sexuality, where 43% of young LGBT people have self-harmed, and astonishingly, over half have had suicidal thoughts. 71% of young LGBT people in Scotland have experienced, in a second, have experienced bullying in school as a result of their sexuality. That is up 10% in the last 10 years. So shame of us if we think our job is done today. I will give way. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for giving way uh, on one of the, the few topics uh, of the, the issues that we debate in here on which we're probably on the same page uh, pretty much 100%. But does he agree with me that because we don't just have private lives, we are also in public life. It is absolutely essential if we want to see the further progress that he's talking about, that our voters know where we stand on these issues when they look up the record of how members in this parliament have voted on issues like this, that they do so in accordance with what they truly believe. I can allow you the time. Jamie Green. Yes, Mr Harvey. Uh, the record will show people's uh, voting patterns. I would like to think that people vote uh, for what they believe in this place. Uh, yes, we have whips. Yes, uh, we have conformity with partisan views. But it's absolutely down to individuals that, that have to face the public after today and say, this is how I voted and this is why I voted in that way. And I hope people vote for the reasons that they believe in rather than just because they think it's the right thing to do, to be seen to be doing the right thing. The term gay used to mean happy in the days of this book. But it's also been used to describe deviance and immorality and choice and preference it morphed from a sexuality and an adjective into a noun and a label. But today, presiding officer, there are young people sitting at home who are too scared to go to school because being gay is still an insult on a daily basis to them, just as they did in the 90s when I was at school. In that respect, nothing has changed. Our job is done when being gay once again means to be happy because everyone has that right to live their life as they please, to sleep with who they please, to marry who they wish, to apply for the job they think they're qualified for, and also to look back with no sense of shame or remorse. Just as we put an end to the stigma of wrongful past convictions, we must put an end to the stigma that sexuality still has today in, to, uh, in today's society. Future generations may not need legislation to pardon our legal wrongdoings, for there are none, but they may need to apologize for the way we are failing our young people today. I add my voice to those who speak to people that this bill seeks to pardon. We do apologize for our actions. We apologize for the actions of others in the past. We are sorry, I am sorry, but what a better way to pay tribute to these people whose lives were ruined by discrimination than by committing today collectively as politicians, as parties, and as a parliament to eliminate stigma and discrimination from the lives of every LGBTI youth in Scotland. For just as we judge the actions of those in the past, Presiding officer, we too will be judged by our actions. I call Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. Uh, ten minutes will take us to decision time, please, Cabinet Secretary. Is that a laid back ten minutes, Presiding Officer? No, it's quite oh, a, okay. a sort of uh, laid back. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I uh, welcome uh, the many positive contributions that have been this afternoon in this uh, particular. A debate from right across the chamber. And very often when we have debates in this chamber at stage three, we talk about the, the value of legislation and the direct impact that it can actually have on individuals. Uh, and often we can miss the point about the way in which legis legislation can inspire change in itself uh, and also the way in which it can send out a very clear message, which can be very often it's 
uh, its most lasting legacy uh, rather than the legislation in its own. Which bring this, brings me to the point that was made by Derek Mackay in his intervention to Pauline McNeill. That an important element of this legislation is not just about seeking to right the wrongs of the past. It's also about setting our course for the future. A course where we do not tolerate any form of discrimination within our society. And this bill shouldn't be about uh, looking to erase the past. And Patrick Harvey was correct in uh, pointing that out. It is about uh, setting right that historical wrong uh, that was made uh, over many, many years. And many here today have apologised and expressed uh, their support for righting that wrong. And a number of members of uh, past comment as well, and uh, Daniel Johnson made this particular point about it's an opportunity for us to also uh, reflect on where we are as a society uh, and the values that we seek to set for a modern Scotland. But also in reflecting back on how it's taken us so long to arrive at this particular point in uh, this journey of ensuring that we deliver equality in our society. And yes, it has taken too long for us to arrive at this particular point on the journey. But what I do think has happened is that although we've been going in a slow, slow lane for many, many years, I think all of us would recognise that Scotland has been in the fast lane in recent years in making sure that we address the deficits of the past and in creating a modern, inclusive Scotland. And a key part of doing that is not just about making sure we get it right here in Scotland, but it's also about making sure that we stand up internationally in recognising the value of equality in every society. And as Polly McNeill made the very point in her own contribution, the fact that some 37% of countries in the world continue to have legislation that discriminates against individuals based on their sexuality. And part of our effort should be to add our voice to those international voices about the need for greater progression in these areas. I want to turn, though, to some of the very specific aspects that have been raised in the course of this debate. Although we can right the wrongs of the past and the state-sponsored discrimination that legislation enforced on individuals, what we can't do, though, is we can't always address those issues and the pain it's been caused to families and individuals as a result of those actions. And I recognise that we are creating a system that enables and provides for those who have the opportunity today to apply for a disregard and to have it removed from their criminal record. And for those who are not in a place or not able to do so, that it will be difficult. Uh, it will leave a difficult legacy for them. Which is why the uh, amendments which were brought forward by Mary Fee at stage two provided us with a, a, a very good opportunity to set out the posthumous disregard arrangements that we will put in place, where there will be provision for those uh, family members to be able to uh, make representations, setting out the terms of what they understand, uh, where, the, uh, where the nature of the incident itself, and for us to give consideration to that and to issue a letter of comfort, setting out very clearly that this is a conditional disregard based on the information which they have provided. And on that basis, had that deceased person uh, been in a position to apply for a disregard, it's likely that they would have been provided with one too. I also want to emphasise the importance of the simplicity of the process of application, because that will be critical to its success in making sure that people feel it is a user-friendly system that is easy for them to access. But to give that added assurance, that added assurance to those about our commitment to ensuring this system works as effectively as possible, we're also making legal aid provisions available for those who may seek legal representation in making such an application for the disregard scheme, but also uh, should they seek to appeal any decision of a disregard that is not in their favour, to allow them the opportunity to challenge that particular decision. But importantly, we need to make sure that people who could benefit from this particular scheme are aware of it being in place. And for those of us in the Holyrood bubble who may be aware of it, those of us who are involved in different forms of 
uh, politics within our local communities as well. We may, be, we may be able to spread the word, but the reality is for many people, they are not involved in that environment and will not be aware of this particular issue. And that's why I'm absolutely committed to making sure that central to passing this legislation uh, will be the public information campaign, which we will run to try and ensure that we reach as many people in Scotland as possible to make them aware of the provisions within this legislation. And in doing that, in a way that reaches not just from our uh, cities and towns, but right into our rural and urban areas, rural areas as well, and our island communities, to ensure that people are aware of the scheme and how the scheme uh, will operate. Of course, I'm happy to give way to the member. Jamie Green. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. On that specific point, would he commit to uh, keeping Parliament and the Chamber up to date as the strategy is produced, detailing what that strategy will be and getting that message out to people, including any budget that you may put behind doing so? Michael Matheson. I'm saying, officer, I'm more than happy to do that. And if it would help, I'm more than happy to make sure that that information is provided to the, uh, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Committee on an ongoing basis and the progress we're making in a number of the areas that need to be taken forward following the uh, passage of this particular piece of legislation. The public information elements of it, obviously there will be regulations which will be brought forward for the purposes of the, uh, for the legal aid provisions, but also the posthumous, posthumous disregard arrangements uh, and how that will operate to ensure uh, that Parliament is kept informed of the progress that we make in this uh, important uh, matter. Uh, Annie Wells in her opening comment said that this, uh, this bill is a landmark bill. And she's right, it is a landmark bill. It's a bill which, um, from my perspective, it is somewhat unusual to arrive at stage three with no amendments, but that in itself, I think, is quite symbolic of how the Parliament has come together in, is, and is united in its determination to take forward this piece of legislation. And I am very grateful for the way in which the Equalities and Human Rights Committee have handled consideration of the legislation. And as Christine McKelvey said, this bill matters because today we are righting a wrong. Uh, and today we have an opportunity to vote for pride in making sure we right that wrong. But the bill matters because we are improving the lives of those who have been discriminated against in the past by legislation that previously discriminated against individuals because of their sexuality. And as we come to voting time tonight, presiding officer, it's right that we do right the wrongs of the past. Uh, and as we set our course uh, for uh, the future, a future of a modern Scotland which is tolerant and is inclusive, one which is outward focused and sharing our story and our experiences with other parts of the world in seeking to spread equality and opportunity across all countries in the world. But it's an opportunity for us all tonight to vote with pride in righting that wrong. And as Stuart Stevenson said in his contribution this evening, we can also vote with gladness in our heart that we have the opportunity to put the wrong right here tonight by voting for this bill. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. That concludes our Stage 3 debate on Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of Business Motion 12597 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. If anyone objects to this programme, please say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that Motion 12597 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 12599 on approval of an SSI. Can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick again to move this on behalf of the Bureau? Moved. Thank you. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that Motion 12573, in the name of Michael Matheson, on historical sexual offences, pardons and disregards, Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed. And members will need to vote its legislation, so members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 12573 in the name of Michael Matheson is yes, 119. There are no votes against or abstentions. The motion is unanimously agreed, therefore, and the historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Scotland Bill is passed. Thank you. The final question this evening is that motion 12599 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business. The name of Ruth Maguire on the Citizen Girl Initiative. And we'll just take a few moments for the member and other members to change seats.